Let me start with the most boring seeming topic of what is money and probably the most obvious topic we all believe we understand. We all get, let's say, 100 rupee note that we believe to be money. Do you know that money is not actually of any value by itself? That note itself, have you read it? It says uh, by the, I think the RBI governor that I owe to pay you worth 100 right? That is what it reads. That hundred is not a hundred by itself. It's just a token. The token, which is limited in supply, there are a limited number of hundred rupee notes, mm -hmm. an example, that we are all exchanging with each other in lieu of any transaction. So that hundred rupee note that we are used to believing is money itself. Is just a token that entitles you to get 100 from Government of India or Reserve Bank of India, right? Now, that token has become so much in circulation that all of us consider that itself to be money without actually realizing that it, it is just a token 200 rupees. And of course, it's become very accepted in our day-to-day -day practice for any transaction. We just take it around and give it to people, take it from people and do something with it. Let me rewind the clock and take you back to our history you may have read or stories you may have heard that maybe hundreds, thousands of years ago, even more than 200 years ago, this was not a standard practice. This currency notes have become standard practice only uh, a couple of centuries ago. Before that, and going way before hundreds of years, initially what would we have? We had no concept of money when humans were in a tribal stage or as hunter-gatherers, they would just hunt and gather and live and move on. At worst, they would fight with others, but they would just take their resources and then keep moving on. Eventually, when the agriculture age happened, at some stage, the concept of barter started. Initially, it was still barter. I would give you 100 or 10 kgs of grain. Instead of that, give me two chickens as an example, right? The barter was a very inconvenient system because it was not, it was hard to argue that, okay, I'll give you... 5 kgs of rice, 2 kgs of grains in return for 2 hens and 1 cow, as an example. Now, that was a very complicated system because the value in my mind of my cows was getting converted into your rice or your grains or so. It was not a very convenient system. It just went, there were a lot of rounding ups and downs. There were lots of uh, inconvenience, so to say, compared to what life we live today. Then it evolved and eventually the next thing came. Uh, there were things like seashells that were honored by tribes and by groups of people that, okay, this, these many seashells, I will give you, um, I'll give you this goat in these many seashells or any, anything that looked unique of value, which was not abundant. So number one, for anything to become a transaction, transactional mode, it has to be unique and limited in number. If it is unlimited, we don't value it. This is the human psychology. As an example, we believe that there is abundant air in the world. So we don't value air and we are polluting it like anything. But because there is a limited amount of gold in the world that we can mine and get together, gold is highly valued. At the end of the day, it is just another yellow rock. But it's unlike other rocks, it's limited. And eventually we figured out its use cases. Going back, we used to have, humans used to have the shells. Shells were but exchanging hands as a unit of value. Shells evolved into something which we can relate with, we, which we may have heard in our stories and even uh, mythologies as well, to the gold coins, silver coins, asharfiya that we used to call uh, in the Indian context. Those in that, the value of the gold, let's say gold is, there's a coin of gold. The coin of gold, what it would get you, let's say five cows, the gold coin itself carried the value in it. You do not need a king or any central authority to give you and honor that value for you. Even if you took a gold coin from, let's say, uh, in the past, whatever countries existed, from India to, let's say, Middle East or Jerusalem or uh, Rome, the gold itself, the shape of gold may change, the king on the gold may change, but it would carry 
almost equivalent, if not a little bit more up or down value in Rome as well. The same coin, the same gold coin was carrying the value in it, right? Gold, silver, copper, etc. You could melt it and then use it to do something with it. This is how the transactions happened for thousands of years. Then about a couple of hundred years ago, there was a concept that the countries, as the countries evolved, the industrial age came just before that the country started realizing that the gold was also limited and the country's control over their people, over their taxation, over their finances had to be imposed more and more. So they came up with the idea, one of the ideas that let's create our own coins, which may not be of any, any which may not carry the value in itself, but that coin or a note would be backed by gold or some similar asset. So a, let's say an Indian government 200 years ago or 300 years ago or a British government or American government, if they wanted to print million dollars as an example or a million rupees, they would need to have in those dates value close to a million rupee or a million dollar worth of gold in their backing. So they can honor the currency that's floating in the world. If people come back to them and say, give me a million dollar, they would have million dollar worth of gold or million rupees worth of gold. So this is called the gold backing. Gold backing currency printing. This was a concept that came about. It evolved much more and especially in the last century, one of the evolutions that happened was, this is where the finance starts to get tricky. And if you really start understanding it, you will stop believing in money altogether. You may. Um, what started to happen is that the country started governments in their interest of growing the economy, uh, doing multiple things, they started to print way more than what they had in gold. So they would print like, if they had a million dollar of gold, they could print 2 million, 3 million, 5 million. This is how it started to expand to today's world where US government, even only in 2021, printed like trillions of dollars of rupee, of dollars and there is no gold to back it up. They did not buy any additional gold for that. So they can just essentially print money in thin air, as they call it. This is how the concept of money, notes, tokens has evolved to today. That now there is no backing and then every all the governments are now printing a lot of notes. And to defend this, US, as an example, in today's world, US wants to control the global exchange based currency as US dollar. This is what they call petrodollar. They want core things in the world like gold, like petrol to always be traded in the non-US involved countries. Let's say India is buying oil from Russia. They want it to be priced in US dollar so that the US dollar and printing of US dollar, it stays in somehow their control because they are controlling the tokens. They are controlling in a lot of sense, the value of the token, right? So no, this no. is what the money is. It is a, it is not what we, we never look at money. We look at only the token, token of a hundred rupee note, hundred dollar note, etc. This is pre-digital world when we still have the notes and the coins and all that. And the governments are printing without necessarily backing it up with gold. And the printing has gone up so in such insane amounts that and this is what causes inflation. If you wonder, 2010 to 2020, inflation was not very high. 2020 to 2024, inflation is very high, especially in the Western world. That's because US has printed a lot more money. More money you have in circulation, more the value of goods goes up. You look back on anything you used to buy three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. What is the price today and what is the, what was the price few years ago? Inflation is given to us by this artificial printing of money. One important point here, US Fed, the one that prints all the dollars, they have, they, they have a, a signed US law that they can never be audited. Nobody in the world can go to US Fed and say, tell me how much do dollar, how many dollars you've got in circulation and how much gold you've got to back with it. They said, nobody can ask this question as an example and many more things like that. Nobody can audit the US Fed. So anybody believing in US dollar, 
good luck anybody believing that us dollar will not drop out as a currency or in the years and decades and centuries to come good luck this has changed many times there have been cycles 200 years ago it was the i think the dutch currency which was the standard of the world evolved us dollar became the standard eventually we don't know where it's going to go this is the concept of money that it is just a mode of exchange it is a token and it changes in value because people trust it people believe in it and people believe that indian government will honor indian rupee us government will honor us dollar they will give you that much worth but imagine if the collective belief is lost it carries zero value this concept only works if people keep faith and people keep faith because they are not aware they are never taught they never question they are not aware of all these concepts the concept of money if you start understanding you may find it very hard to keep believing in it okay um this is the first concept second the while they are printing more and more but still the supply is limited supply is not unlimited as of now now the limit may be close to the unlimited amounts like in us dollar comparatively indian india as an example will not print as much as us will because indian rupee nobody wants outside india as much so indian rupee is not needed indian economy is not so strong belief in indian uh businesses is, lim uh, is lesser strong compared to let's say us which is a 20 trillion dollar economy versus a 3 trillion dollar indian economy and um us government defends their dollar with their armies as well the defense that they have where let's say china says deal with me in chinese yuan us government armies will start playing a role so it's a very politically driven managed more than token of exchange which has to be kept in value by faith of people by lack of understanding of people and by armies and by bunch of other geopolitical and macro factors so this is what a currency is currency money by itself is just a token as long as people believe in it if people suddenly one day stop believing in a yellow rock gold will carry zero value if you have an abundant supply of yellow rock available in the world if somebody finds it somewhere or starts to appear somewhere it will carry zero value etc all this money um, and then money evolved now evolve it to today's world i just briefly want to mention the digital money which is what you have on your google pay or bank or um, um, any sort of digital money now that is also a central bank issued amounts to the banks which stay digital there is no hard cash behind it so let's say as an example us fed will say we are printing 10 trillion dollars 1 trillion goes to jp morgan to circulate 1 trillion goes to bank of america i'm just simplifying it this a lot okay this is slightly more complex but i'm just trying to simplify to get the point across they will say 1 bill, 1 trillion goes to jp morgan to circulate 1 trillion goes to uh, bank of america and it's not a give it is i o u it is some something in return they have to give it back also so the us fed owns it eventually but then the circulation increases through banks in a digital form which may just stay in your bank account so it's just a balance sheet uh, uh, account transfer or asset transfer the token is was with the government they printed it in some sense they created it out of thin air gave it to jp morgan as a bank or pnb in india as a bank pnb put it in your account for whatever whoever you got it from or they lent it to you to do certain things in the market at lower interest rates etc etc this money creation will stay digital more and more as it's happening you are used to your google pay you are used to your nefts you are used to today rtgs paytm wallets etc now this becomes a digital only you don't actually even have to print it you can genuinely create it of thin air put it in a digital system and keep it there um this is how it has evolved and uh one of the other concepts i want to briefly introduce again deserves a session on its own is the birth of cryptocurrencies so what happens is that uh some people or folks on internet uh unknown till date in 2008 9 satoshi nakamoto came up with the idea that if this digital money has to be has will grow with the digitization of the world with more and more digital things happening why can't it be global borderless and why can't it be uh, uh not controlled by the us fed they lost faith in us fed the us fed printing notes all the uh, printing money is a joke once you start to get into its details so why can't it be actually controlled by the community of people 
and where 51% of the community has to always decide whether it's the right transaction, whether what is the right thing to do. So truly a decentralized kind of a currency. This is how the cryptocurrencies were born. Bitcoin came into the being, into being, and then it grew over the last few years. Came up with a beautiful idea that let's take the control away from the central authorities like the government, like the central banks, take, give it back to people and let the majority of them decide. As a group, if we are 20 people here, let's say 11 of us can decide what is a digital currency, how much should be in circulation, what should be the limit of supply so it remains, remains valuable. And whether a transaction happened or not, that will be also validated by if at least 51% people have to agree that this happened, this transaction happened. Then only it happens. It's not that I say it or Samir says it or Saraf says it. So that way the decentralization model will come. But by definition, decentralization makes things inefficient. So the inefficiency comes, it takes time for every transaction to be checked, power, etc. And then eventually, let's say I have more dollars than other people in the group and I buy 51% from all of you anyways. I transact in such a way that I end up having 51% or 70%. This is how, this is a problem with Bitcoin today. Or let's say, Saraf says, I want to start my own coin. It'll be called Saraf coin. And I will, it will be unlimited in supply. This is a problem with Ethereum. Or Samir says, I'll start a super Morpheus coin. I'll be the one printing in Excel and putting it in a software using blockchain and blah, blah, blah. This is what Trump is doing, the Trump coin that's coming out. So there are lots of interesting things. Essentially, we have taken the problem from a central authority, which was built over trust, over a political system, over a democratic system to a large extent, defended and accepted by defended by armies, accepted by people, to anybody who is a ABC on the world in the world starting up their own coin. So this is where all the cryptos are for all of you. And you might have heard Elon had started Dodge. Elon had picked up Dodge Dogecoin, which was just meant to be a joke against Bitcoin. And that itself has gone so much up in value. So anyways, collective stupidity of people, we can't really uh, comment on. We should not comment on here, but that's how it works. We'll get into cryptos again, but just understand the concept of a currency, a money note. Money by itself is just a mean mode of exchange. The money you carry with you is a token to something that a central bank or somebody is guaranteeing. Money has to be limited in supply for people to accept it. Money has to be very unitized so we can easily transact compared to the barter system where my one chicken versus a one cow was not making sense. Money has to be accepted. People have to have faith in it that this is a limited supply. I'll keep it. Let's keep it and let's trust in it. But believe you me, we live a very short term life and we have very short term thinking and understanding. Give it a few years, give it a few decades, give it a few centuries, this would evolve, the currencies would change, the mode of exchange would change. And as Sri Aurobindo says, one of the last concepts I want to introduce very briefly, which I also do not understand fully, money itself is not nothing wrong or evil. As a, It is a vital force. It is a conscious force, which is allows for things to be done through it, with it, and uh, in the Indian context, we call money as the representation is a Lakshmi. Lakshmi is a uh, is a Devi, which is a conscious force that goes to some people, stays with some people, doesn't stay with some people, etc. So keep in mind, it is not just it is not completely to be rejected either. Money makes sense. Money is there for a reason. But money is a means to an exchange, and it will only come and stay with some people with consciousness. It is conscious in itself in some sense. Short term, it may feel like inflation is happening, money is not valuable, etc. But eventually these are cycles and in a longer term it all plays out fairly okay.